Welcome. I'm really excited to begin a new series called Origin, where it all started. It'll give us an opportunity to take a look at the life of Jesus and see how Matthew begins to unfold that for us. We're going to come across a lot of familiar stories, and hopefully you'll learn some new things as we go through this process. When we open up the Gospel of Matthew, we are immediately confronted with a genealogy. And it got me thinking about the constant, you know, or the, uh, the very present, um, you know, infatuation with DNA testing and Ancestry.com, 23andMe, all these various kinds of services. I came across some um, statistics on the Internet that I thought was pretty interesting. They said back in 2013, about 330,000 were a total number of DNA test customers. By the end of 2018, there were well over 12 million. Another interesting fact is they said there was about $109 million that were spent on ads by Ancestry.com. Think about that, $109 million. But I also discovered that over $300 million was an amount invested by a pharmaceutical giant for access to 23andMe's genetic database. Hmm, that doesn't sound like a good idea. But genealogies have become popular, right, with the availability of all this DNA testing. It's not as precise a technology as the ads lead one to believe, but um, there appears, um, in fact, that Ancestry tests are revealing some shocking family secrets. There, there appears to be some unintended consequences. The discovery of unexpected dads and unexpected siblings. And in fact, this has happened with such frequency that there is actually a Facebook group called DNA NPE, where NPE stands for Not Parent Expected. And these discoveries have spawned its own unique syndrome called PTDD, post-traumatic DNA test results disorder. It seems that shaking the branches of the family tree may cause some unexpected fruit to fall. <laughs> you know, in the Old Testament, genealogies were very important to the Jews, for without them, they could not prove their tribal memberships, right? or consequently, um, their uh, right to inheritances. And this is seen in various passages in the Old Testament. For example, in Joshua, when he was divvying up the land, people had to show that they were part of that particular tribe. Or in Ezra, when he began to reconstitute the priestly order and made, it, made sure that they were the descendants of Aaron. There are numerous places like that in the Old Testament. But it also holds another significance, which is of interest to us today. See, Jesus is anchored to the whole of the Old Testament story. The unfolding of history is truly his story. Because the promised Christ, which is the Greek translation for the Hebrew Messiah, because the promised Messiah must be descended from both of, uh, uh, or many of these historical figures, what we find as we look at our passage today, that, the un that this unfolding has more to do, as one author puts it this way, he says, the unfolding of history is truly his story because the promised Christ must be descended from historical figures. The documentation of Jesus' lineages, lineage was critically important. So here's a question for us today. What does the genealogy of Jesus teach us, and why should it matter? What does the genealogy of Jesus teach us, and why does it matter? As we soon will discover, right, the family tree of Jesus is full of many unexpected surprises. So let's begin with Matthew 1.1. We read a record of the genealogy, which literally is the book of Genesis. So this is the book of Genesis of Jesus Christ, 
the son of David, the son of Abraham. Boy, there is so much that we can unpack from this one text that may escape the casual reader. This is the beginning. This is the origin for us to find out something about this Jesus who is called the Christ who is, as the text says, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let me me take a step back with you for a moment. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 61, we're given a glimpse of what this uh, Messiah is going to be about. In fact, this passage from Isaiah 61 is repeated by Jesus himself to attest to the fact that He is the coming Messiah. He is the one that was to be expected. And what are those words? It says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. All of this was the ministry that Jesus would have among the people. The consequence of that is when Jesus read this, it rolled up the scroll, and in the hearing of all who had gathered, he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your presence. Jesus understood that he was the Christ. But what does it mean when he says that he's the son of David? There is a text that's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, where a promise is given to King David. And it says this. It says, of your house and your kingdom, it will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Speaking of David and of his kingly reign, it says that of his house and of his kingdom, it will endure forever, forever established before God. That meant that someone was going to rule in this lineage of David, and that ruler would be this Messiah that had been promised. But it goes on, it says that he was also a son of Abraham. Well, God made a promise to Abraham too. Maybe some of you might remember this text. It's found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says here that the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who curse, who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is part of the Abrahamic covenant. This is the promise that God says, not only am I going to give you land, and not only am I going to give you prosperity, but God says, I am also going to give you posterity. Your people will increase and abound you and your descendants will prove to be a blessing to the entire world. And if that were not enough, God would go on to say this to Abram in verse 17, adding and reaffirming this covenant. He says this, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. So do you catch that? In the opening lines, this is the origin, the the genesis of Jesus, the Messiah, the one who is claiming to be seating on that throne of David and who is part of the covenant promise of Abraham. See, there was great intention in what Matthew is writing. His genealogy, the Old Testament history leading up to the birth of Christ, 
is, as we will find, a very perfectly ordered, perfectly planned, controlled flow of history. Matthew does this in a very deliberate way. He uses three standards, uh, uh, stanzas of 14 names. And I want you to understand this. It's not a comprehensive genealogy. If you were to study the first two stanzas in this genealogy, you'll recognize that there are some names that are missing when we compare that to, let's say, First Chronicles in chapter 3, or the unfolding of some of these families and their descendants. So what it says to us, while it's not a comprehensive genealogy, it is, according to Matthew, a theological reflection on the working out of God's purpose for his people. He's going to show how this Jesus is the fulfillment of not only the claims of Messiahship, but also that he truly is the son of of David and the son of Abraham. Because God has a plan to bless all of humanity. There are many lessons that we're going to find in these names. So what I'd like to do is just put up this, this first stanza that reads, Abraham was the father of Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, I know for many, you read a text like that, and your eyes just begin to glaze over. And if we don't keep the main thing before us, sometimes we might, we might miss out on some of the real nuggets that God is beginning to show us in this text. One of the things, as you look at a high level, is to recognize that here is a genealogy of the promise that God made to Abraham, that from his seed, he will bless all the nations of the world. From his seed, kings would come forth. So if it starts off by saying here, that that Jesus was the son of Abraham, and then it starts to give you this whole delineation of how that works, beginning with Abraham. Notice how in this first stanza, it starts with the promise of a covenant that God made with Abraham to bless all the nations, to bring kings from his line, and now we find that it's fulfilled in King David. God knows how to keep his promise. But I also want you to see something else here. God is using flawed humans as he carries history forward. If you go back and read on this, in, in the book of Genesis or the story of Abraham, you'll realize that Abraham came from nothing. In fact, he came from the city of Ur that was near the Persian Gulf. It was a pagan city. He was He was a a pagan, uh, from pagan background. And God would use him to be the father of the nation of Israel. That God would use him as the covenant, uh, uh, the the keeper of this covenant, that would eventually, he would have a son named Isaac, and Isaac would have Jacob, and Jacob would become, become the father of the 12 tribes who comprised all of Israel. But Jacob, he was known as a supplanter, a twister. There was some wrestling that took place between Jacob and God. There's numerous stories about the duplicity that sometimes Jacob would get involved in. And then there is his love for Rachel and Leah, where Rachel, it said, was pleasing to the eyes, and maybe Leah not so much, and All you got to do is look at the accounts of the children that were fathered, um, that Jacob uh, had with Leah. And after every time Leah has a child, she says, maybe now my husband will love me. 
And this continues all the way until she finally gets to the one son named Judah and says, this time I will praise the Lord. So Jacob, he's not this perfect example either, right? There is definitely flaws in his character. And then did you notice in our text it ends with King David? And then by way of description, it says David is the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Uriah's wife. Hmm. Who could that be? How about Bathsheba? How about that whole story of David not only um, impregnating Bathsheba while her husband Uriah was out to war, but as we read in the book of 2 Samuel, right, it tells us the whole story of how, how, about, uh, how David conspired and had Uriah killed. Yeah, think about this for a moment. This family tree now that God is beginning to show how he's going to keep this promise that this Jesus, who is the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham, is flowing through all of these very flawed individuals as God is beginning to carry forward his plans and his purposes. But I want you to look back at this text again. And now what I want to do is I'm going to highlight something else that I want you to see. I want you to notice the women whose names are listed in our text. The names of Tamar and Rahab, Ruth, and Uriah's wife, which is Bathsheba. It's interesting that women are included in this genealogy because very often it wasn't, you know, property, inheritance. All of that was done through the male, not the women. So their inclusion doesn't seem to have any really necessary point if you're just looking for property or inheritance, which gives you a clue again that maybe Matthew has something else in mind here. Women are now included in this genealogy, and they play a very important role. But you read about the story of Tamar, and she winds up bearing children to her father-in-law, Judah. When her husband, Ur, passed away, she disguised herself, and it says that Judah wound up sleeping with her, and she bore the twins, as we read about them in our text. Or how about Rahab, who was known as the prostitute, who helped the Israelites escape the, the ruins of the walls of Jericho? Or how about we find in our text here, Ruth, who was a Moabite woman, who um, Naomi, in the book of Ruth, helps and tries to find her a kinsman, redeemer. And then Bathsheba. All these women, they're non-Israelites. Two of them were Canaanite. One of them was a Moabite. The other one was a Hittite. But they're included in this story. And if truth be known, even though they might have a sordid past, in the eyes of Israel, they played significant roles and were actually held in high regard. Even though Rahab was known as, the, as a prostitute, she still was the one who rescued the people and gave, and, and, and gave um, um, the spies of, of, uh, of Israel, you know, a, a safe haven. Yeah, so I, I look at this text, and then you begin to see, okay, God is using flawed people in this whole storyline, which says that maybe God is showing grace throughout history, that he doesn't count our sins against us. God looks at the intentions of a man's heart. And even though, for instance, David would sin before God, all you have to do is read Psalm 51 and realize the deep repentance that came from 
David's lips. But there's more that we learn as we look at these genealogies. Look at the second stanza. I'm just going to put it up on the screen, but it begins with Solomon, and then it goes to Rehoboam. Notice how it ends here. It says, it ends with Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Just on a, another, like on a higher level here, what you begin to realize here is that under Solomon, the kingdom was united. Under Solomon, the temple was built. Under Solomon, his wisdom had worldwide reputation. Under Solomon, the, 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 um, the boundaries of, of Israel would, would grow and flourish. But after Solomon, we read about Rehoboam. And then what transcends here is we find that there is a divided kingdom. And you'll read stories of these kings who turned their backs on the things of God, who induced people to, to false worship and brought upon themselves a judgment of God that would eventually come in, the, in their exile to Babylon. So here in this passage, if, if in the first stanzas we look and we see something of the grace of God being extended, I want you to notice in our text here what started off in the sense of unity now is found in the disunity of people who have taken their eyes off of the things of God and now they find themselves exiled, overrun by the foreign nations of Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. When I read this text, I realize that God is a just God who's going to hold his people accountable. But you also realize that there is this redemptive work that God is doing. And even though the, the, the Israel has gone away, God is always seeking to win back this remnant. I, I think again, right, of those words in Jeremiah 29, 11, words that many of you have on little bumper stickers or bookmarks that, that say, I know the plans I have for you, not to, uh, not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you a hope in the future, comes from Jeremiah 29, 11. And in that text, what do we find? But we, what, what we discover in this text is that God is making a promise to those who are about to be exiled that he will bring them back after a period of 70 years. So in this genealogy, a story is beginning to unfold that Jesus, the Messiah, who is the son of David, the son of Abraham, this promise is going to be fulfilled. Promises are going to be kept, but they're going to work through flawed humanity. It's going to come from a nation who will turn their backs on God at times to the place where God will judge them by sending them off into exile, but always with a desire to bring them back and redeem them again. There's another stanza here, and um, it says, after the exile to Babylon, then we read names like Sheatiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel played a key role in the establishment of Israel when they came back into the, from the foreign lands. But Zerubbabel was not a king anymore. They called him a governor, which begins to show you then, as you begin to read in these texts, that this line of David, it finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus. Because all these other names here are not kings. There's only one who is going to be the true son of David. And that will be Jesus, who is called the Christ, the Messiah. The monarchy here is not restored. There is a, a historian by the name of Julius Africanus, who reported that Herod had destroyed 
uh, Jewish family archives, including those of the Davidic family, to prevent any challenge to his own mixed pedigree. That's written for us by a third century historian named Eusebius. In Matthew's account, it will be Joseph as the legal father who is the lead player in the stories that are to come. And by introducing him as the husband of Mary rather than the father of Jesus, Matthew then begins to prepare for the explanation of Jesus' actual parentage. And we're going to get into those stories in the weeks to come. But do you notice in the bringing of the people back, those names are foreign to us, but they all find their fulfillment now going through these motions where God is demonstrating grace, where God is demonstrating his sovereignty over all the affairs of man. And now he brings them to a place where Jesus is born. What you find here is that God is saying he's also the God of the second chance. In a genealogy that is just listing how God is working in space and time, this Jesus wasn't just an afterthought. It wasn't someone with a winsome personality and a, um, and a clever way with words. But no, he was in demonstration of the Spirit's power. He was truly the one who was the word that was with God, was God, and is God. This word becomes flesh. And now we see that in these texts, as it unfolds over these many generations. For Matthew, who's writing this gospel, it's a way to show people again that this Jesus is a fulfillment of, of promises made and promises kept. So what does this have to do with you and me? Well, one takeaway, I think, is for us to watch the news and you realize that the world has not changed very much. Uh, we worry, too, about where all this is headed, right? We worry about what the future is going to hold. How could God possibly use some of the characters that we're contending with in the world in which we live? Is it any wonder that the times are just filled with anxiety? But here, Matthew is beginning to interject. And he's saying, God has blessed the world with Jesus. That Jesus is a sign of his grace to the world as that promise was made, and despite how people turned their backs on God, God kept his word from the line of Abraham, from the line of David, would come a king whose throne will be forever. Not only is he a sign of God's grace, but this Jesus is a sign of that God is just and redemptive, a God who offers second chances. So already here in the genealogy, Jesus is presented as the one who will ignore human labels of legitimacy and illegitimacy to offer his gospel, his good news of salvation to all who will listen, including the most despised and outcast of society. After all, some of those were included in his own background, were they not? And what we're left with is a king who is blameless, spotless. A, not just a king, but a prophet. He will become Emmanuel, God with us. In the words of one of the New Testament scholars, it says, Jesus will rule the world not by troops, but by words. And as a preview of what's to come, would not God say to us of Jesus, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. You see, Jesus, he is that Messiah. 
He is the Savior of the world. After all, that's what his name means. So this origin sketched for us in a brief genealogy begins to underscore these many qualities that will be a part of this Jesus that we will become very familiar with as we walk through this Gospel of Matthew. I hope it gives you a sense of confidence to know that nothing, nothing, kingdoms that come, that fall, those who rise up and defile the very will of God in their generation, all of which is displayed through the names and characters that are found in these genealogies, none of that will ever thwart God from fulfilling his will and his purposes for those who love him. There is confidence in that. We're being introduced to someone very special. He is the Messiah. He is God's Son, the sinner Savior. He is the breath of life. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for these words that as we just pause and begin to just reflect on their meaning, we begin to be introduced to not only your character, but your character as it is leading to the birth of a Savior. Is it any wonder that every year we will celebrate joy to the world? The Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Father, I pray that what may be familiar to our ears, you would begin to just open our eyes that we can see the rich treasure that is involved in the person and work of Jesus. One who extends grace, one who is just and who is redemptive, and one who is the God of the second chance, offering it freely to all who have ears to hear and eyes to see. I'm asking, Lord, that you bless our studies in the days to come. You raise up a people to confront the darkness of our day. That you give us this land of which we are which we find ourselves here ministering. And then you give us all that we need, Lord, to show ourselves faithful. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.